uh, is Vasil Africa, conducting a series of training for the next one and month. And we're starting with personal financial planning. Um, Daniel works for, as the brand manager for Titan Investment. I think he will continue introducing himself. Um, if you have any questions, kindly type them and then we will address, address them at the end. Thank you. Daniel, you can take over. Welcome to the training. My name is Daniel Mainye. I work for Site on Investments. Uh, so today I'm going to just run you through quick about debt management and a bit about investments. So I'll try and run through pretty much first. The presentation will be shared. So in case anybody wants it, you can go through it. Um, so we have, we're going to talk about uh, one, the objectives of the training. We learn about what is good debt, what is bad debt, factors to consider and mitigation measures. We'll talk a little about, uh, about investing and then from there, what are the factors to consider when, 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 when investing? Um, so the objectives here, one will be to understand how to use debt to create wealth, to understand how to borrow wisely, to understand how to reduce financial distress related to debts, to establish how to make your money work for you, and also to understand how to make potential optimal returns. Now, how do you use debt to create wealth? It's very big question. Um, one, is debt a good thing or a bad thing? I know that's always a big question. Uh, should I buy a car or not a car? Should I buy a house or should I travel to Dubai? Uh, or should I use that money to uh, to buy a plot? You know, what are the reasons and why do some people fear loans? Okay. Now, loans are not generally bad, but it's the use that will always uh, determine whether it's good or bad. Okay. Now, good debt is debt that is taken for investment. Of course, at the end of the day, it will grow in value or generate some sort of income for you. On the other side, uh, uh, good debt can help you build what we call long-term wealth. Because remember, at the end of the day, it's creating value, it's generating income. Therefore, in the long run, you're building wealth. Now, what are the characteristics of this thing we call good debt? One is that the assets outlast the time it pays, it takes to pay off that particular loan. So if you're taking a loan for uh, a particular asset, uh, it will be a good debt if that asset outlasts that, uh, the time it takes to pay off that loan. So for example, if you buy land right now, you buy a house, uh, and you pay it off over five years. Remember, the asset will outlast the, that particular loan. Income earned and value of the acquired asset exceeds the cost of the loan. So you can borrow one million loan uh, for you to pay off an asset that at the end of the day, the value will be less than that one million. The income generated can repay for the cover, uh, for, for cover to cover the cost of that particular loan, uh, which means if you go into some uh, revenue generating um, type of business and you take a loan for it, that the income can repay uh, the cost of that particular loan and then to repay the loan with some extra income. So at a certain point where you can be able to pay that interest, but on top of it, you're still earning some decent interest out of it. So what are the examples of good debt? One is mortgage loan, um, because at the end of the day, once you finish that particular loan, you will be able to own the house and continue generating value from that particular asset. There's business expansion loan, which as we've talked about, at the end of the day, you need to ensure that the income generated can repay for the loan or at the end of the day also generate some income out of it. Then taking a loan for something off plan, in most cases off plan real estate. Uh, those are some of the examples of good debt, student loans, because you're adding knowledge. Uh, therefore, the value for you as an individual increases. And then car loan for business use. And again, underline car loan for business use because business therefore generates income. Now, what is bad debt? Bad debt, on the other hand, is a debt taken for consumption purposes, okay? Uh, you take a loan to travel to Diani, to G, could you enjoy? You take a loan to buy a car that uh, will only be used to travel to, um, what is it called? Uh, to Naivasha for the weekend and back. 
um, loan you take to buy a uh, house, you know, debt that you're just clearly taking for consumption purposes. So it is debt you incur to purchase things that quickly lose their value and do not generate long-term income. least it's percent of its value by the time it steps out of that showroom. So you've bought a what are the characteristics and erode your network? Uh because then at the end of the day you have to if you're looking at what your network will look like, you look at You have a lower or with the benefit finish paying for it, the asset continues gaining value, but you buy an asset that uh, in terms of value is already eroded, that really is a bad debt. Value accrued from the asset is less than the cost of it. The rate that is charged is beyond the rate of profitability of the business. So for example, you took a loan to build up a business, but the interest rate you're paying is beyond the profitability of the farm. So at the end of the day, you're on a negative. Your business is not even breaking even. So at that point in time, that is considered that loan. So the perpetual debt means utakufa na madeni, for lack of a better word. Uh, you'll constantly be on negatives uh, for the rest of your life. So you need to be very careful that uh, you don't get into such scenarios. There are, for sure, there are few individuals who are in perpetual debt right now, and you don't want to envy their lives because it's not that, uh, it's very stressful. So examples of bad debt is uh, you take a loan to buy shares. Remember now the share mar the shares market is very volatile, okay? And this will be the most ridiculous thing you can do. And I remember uh, when Safaricom shares were floated, a lot of people rushed to, take loans and I'll give you that because it's a very good example of a bad debt. So what happened is that before the Safaricom guys floated their shares, there was Kenjen shares and Kenjen really performed so well. I remember people bought the shares at three shillings within two months, the shares had hit 30 shillings per share. And at that point in time, people were like, wow, this share thing is, 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 is good business. So when Safaricom floated the share, people were like, ah, it's Safaricom, the biggest telecommunication company is going to perform better than Kenjen. Within two months, we, so if we rush, take a loan for 100,000 and put it, within three months, if, if we bought it at five shillings, it would have skyrocketed to 40 shillings, we'll be making a killing. Unfortunately, uh, what happened with the Safaricom share is that we, the, within the two months to three months of its trading, it actually went down. From five shillings, it went to, I think, two to three shillings. And you can imagine if somebody had taken a loan for 100,000 shillings, is now paying the loan and they is not gaining any value from this share. It took Safaricom close to five to six years to even go uh, from the five shillings to at least 10 shillings. So you can imagine you're already paying a loan, uh, but on the other side, the share is not performing. So an example of a bad debt. Car loan for personal use, surely, why would you do that? Or would you buy a loan to get a car for you to just drive to Naivasha and back? And we'll see a good example of it in the next page. Credit card and salary advances. Yeah. Or would you want to get into credit cards if really it's not for uh, supporting new build incremental income? Uh, if you have a credit card and you're suffering right now, my advice is just take a scissors. We do this training and cut it into half. And... Uh, uh, go and talk to the bank to see how you can restructure it. Loan to start a business. That's an example of a bad debt because remember, businesses, again, it's not like if you start it today, you're assured that it's going to boom tomorrow. That's why it's normally said before, uh, how do you raise money? There's always, uh, they say from 
family, friends, and fools, the three Fs of initial fundraising for a business. It's family, friends, and fools. Uh, don't go into loans to start up a business because businesses, you're not assured. It's not like the somewhere you are told, if you start this business tomorrow, tomorrow you get uh, an incremental income of this amount of money. So at that point in time, normally for businesses, advice to dip into your savings, borrow from family or fools, which means at the end of the day, you don't have any uh, loans that you have to pay off uh, to uh, an institution at the end of every month for a business that is not performing. Then also loans to pay monthly expenses, like you're borrowing to pay rent, or you're borrowing to buy fuel, or you're borrowing to uh, what take your girlfriend out, as in the certain expenses are so ridiculous uh, that you you want to borrow a loan to enjoy yourself instead of borrowing a loan to build income for yourself. Uh, those are just some of the examples of bad, and I'm sure in each of you individually you have all those bad debts, you know them. I'm sure as I speak, you are thinking through them. You're like, I know this one is a bad debt. Yeah? And we'll see a bit of uh, how to get out of it. Now, bad debt, taking a car loan, for example, you a Subaru will cost you 1.2 million. I use Subarus because it's every young guy's dream that if they start a job, they'll own a Subaru. Uh, in one year, if you are to repay that loan, the monthly loan repayment for 1.2 million, if you are to pay it off in one year, it will be 100 and 8,000, okay? 108K uh, monthly payment looking at around 14%, that's, you'll have paid 1.3 million. But the car value will have depreciated down to 900K to 970K, and it will continue depreciating. If you are to take it, pay over five years, you'll be paying 28K per month. Uh, in total, you'll have paid 1.68 million, but that car at that point in time will be valued for only 480K. So why take a loan to do such a thing? Okay, this gives you a good illustration about bad debts. Because if you, the value is depreciating and yet you're still paying interest, at the end of the day, you're buying a, uh, an asset at 1.68 million, but then at the point you finish paying for it, the asset in itself is already devalued. Why would you go into such an arrangement? Okay, now the causes of bad debts. One is over indebtedness and multiple borrowing. And I'm sure you have, uh, friends and family who just like borrowing. They even borrow to pay another uh, debt uh, and then borrow again to pay this other debt. You know, they've reached that level of of uh, borrowing. Wrong financial plans or decisions, yeah? Those are some of the causes. Of ambition in financial matters. You're like, no, if I take this loan and I do this, this, this thing, I'm going to be in, in, in business. Uh, I would relate this to the analogy of quail eggs and cryptocurrencies and all these things where people like themselves that within two months, three months, I'm going to make a killing. So you, you are ambitious in terms of your financial matters. Irregular incomes and salary delays uh, that are some of the causes of bad debts. Unattainable lifestyle, yeah? You know, peer pressure. You always want to be out buying drinks, buying, doing this, doing that, because you are like, I need to maintain this lifestyle because people are watching me. And then there's also lack of financial literacy. And I guess it's good to have such trainings because then they give you a bit of information and knowledge on how to handle some of these matters. So which leads, of course, to reckless spending because you don't know what do I do? I have this amount of money. Uh, at the end of the day, you ask, when you hit the end of the month, you're already struggling. Uh, once somebody told me about uh, uh, the, the faces of, of uh, typical Kenyan spending can be described uh in in uh in, in a way that uh in, at the end of the month or the beginning of the month uh we all are eating chicken because salaries have just arrived between mid month we are eating chicken products which means you can only afford to eat eggs but at the end of the month you're now feeding on chicken feed which is kumawiki and all that because things are thick so Lack of financial literacy leads to such things, reckless spending, because then you don't have a structure on how to, to go about them, okay? Now, what are the remedial actions that you can take quickly on how to manage bad debts? And, and remember this thing, it's, uh, they, they, uh, they, are, they, they are specific to each individual because there are certain things that might not relate to you, but it's good to pick up them. And when we go to Q&A, you can ask and we see how to address. So one is to negotiate, uh, for loan restructure with the lender, so lower the monthly payments. And at least during this COVID period, if you're having a difficulty 
Uh, I know banks are allowing you a three month holiday where you can uh, put on hold repayments uh, as you restructure, or you can ask them, please, I would like to pay this uh, amount of money per month. This is what I can afford. Can you restructure it? There's also debt consolidation. So if you have multiple loans in multiple places, you can decide and consolidate them into one uh, so that you don't have to pay off uh, different uh, rates in different institutions. Of course, you go, you look for the lower one. So if, for example, you have a circle loan and you have a bank loan, you can talk to your circle to consolidate your bank loan so that you pay it at a lower interest at the circle. And circles have seen most of them do uh, offer those type of services. Debt counseling and structuring. Now, remember debt, just like alcohol addiction, just like uh, uh, any other addiction, is is, is uh, counselable. So you can actually look for a debt counselor to actually sit down with them and guide you through uh, your debt issues. Because it's a it's a really a bad it's a what is it called? It's a it's a it's a critical thing in 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 our lives. De debt management can make or break families. I've seen families that. Um, split because of issues of debt. This guy has taken too many loans. I can't afford to live in this house anymore. So debt counseling and restructuring is critical. There's also converting your loan facilities into affordable credit facilities. So for example, for businesses, instead of going and taking the whole loan in advance, you can negotiate overdrafts where you can, uh, whenever you need it, you can take. When you don't need it, you don't need to take. You don't need to have to pay for a loan that uh, instead of taking three million and yet all you needed is only 50k right now, you can discuss on overdraft where when you need it, you can get it. But when you don't need it also, you don't need to be paying for something that you are not in need of. Um, other, uh, in terms of alternative action for bad debts, one is purchase in cash if you can. Uh, avoid borrowing when you have even cash, just go and, and buy that thing in cash. Uh, Tabia, I, I always have to have cash and therefore let me loan myself some money to buy this item. Stop it. Two is saving. Critical. That's actually that's the uh, biggest course of action that you need to take in your life if you want to get out of debt. Save. Just start saving. Uh, if you can, uh, deny yourself a lot of pleasures because then the day you will end up retiring or the day you will need that money to do something, uh, you will, you will, you will, at that point, you will uh, thank yourself for actually starting to save way early. You can start saving as, as early as university. That help money you are given. If you could just take 2K or 3K and put it aside, you can imagine how much value you'd have created for yourself by now. Two is investing. Uh, uh, investing. We also have postponed gratification. Unataka kujishukuru at the end of the month. Nimefanya kazi mzuri. So unataka kujishukuru na create mbili za bia. Yeah? Postpone it. Say, I will not uh, shukuru myself this month. I will shukuru myself at the end of the year. So postpone it and take that money and put it somewhere to earn you more money. In terms of uh, when to borrow rather than uh, to save, there are situations where you are forced to actually borrow than start saving to, uh, to then help you achieve a goal. So what at this point, what are some of the scenarios? So one is, if you need something immediately and cannot wait to save, and remember, still talking back to those points we addressed before, it can only be an immediate need that is going to give you long-term value that is higher than the cost of borrowing. If it will take a long time to save up for what you want, take advantage, you want to take advantage of an investment opportunity. So like you want to buy into real estate, you can't save, by the time you save, you'll have lost that opportunity. So you can borrow to get into that, uh, in, uh, take advantage of it. If the gain from direct purchase outweighs the cost of borrowing, you therefore can borrow. And then if the lump sum payment is required. So for example, real estate where you want to buy a house and they tell you, you need to give us a down payment of at least 1.6 million. So if a lump sum is required at that point, you can be able to borrow. But remember, it's only for where long-term value outweighs the cost of that particular uh, uh, goal that you want to achieve. Now, what are the factors you consider when borrowing uh, to borrow or to save? How quickly do you need the money? If you decide to borrow, what's the best option? Okay, then what type of loans and how much will they cost? Very critical. Will you be able to borrow? That's another thing. Will you be able to borrow? Don't expect that every other time you, you will have the capacity to borrow. Can you afford to borrow? 
look at yourself, your situation. Do you have a, uh, some income that can pay interest or is this thing going to pay you off interest? Don't borrow without a plan. Don't borrow banking on something that is not sustainable. Don't borrow uh, hoping for miracles. They, as we always say, you can't budget on hope. You can't budget on miracles. Then how will you repay a loan if you are unable to work? So think about all these things before you decide I'm going to, I'm going to borrow. Because you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you are cornered and it's life becomes so difficult because you have debts to pay, you are, you've lost your job, but at the same time, there's no other stream of income. Now, after understanding debt, it's good to also understand about investing, because then the only way you can get out of yourself in debt, as I talked about, is saving and investing. And you can start small. You don't need to start big. But at the same time, it, there are certain things you need to understand about investing. So it's not about waking up in the morning and saying, I want to start investing. Because remember, the only cure for debt is investing or saving. Because if you don't do either of those and expect that you'll just be borrowing, 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 but not saving, 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 and investing times three, uh, you, you are going to get yourself in a very bad situation because then you'll have so much debt, but really uh, a low amount of income coming in at the end of the month to enable you even offset all these things. So what is investing? Now, have you injected money in any investment? So this is a question to all of you in this team. Have you thought about investing or have you even started injecting any amount of money? What, what was it? And then what was your experience? Have, has any of your investments collapsed? Okay, because again, critical question. Investing, as I said, it's not just wake up in the morning and say, oh, boom, now we are going to invest. We are here, okay, fine, let's put money. You'll end up like the Kakuyos of this world where the companies went under with people's money. So you have to be very intentional when it comes to investment. So investing, your money uh, is your money making money for you, yeah? Every investment has both risks and returns. So you need to understand them before diving into them, okay? So what are the char characteristics of investments? One, you need to understand the expected return. It's the gain you expect to obtain, yeah? In most cases, again, each of the investment gives you a, a certain return. Even real estate, you need to ask yourself, what is the return? If you're very keen on real estate, uh, especially, you need to ask for, you need to ask questions around where are you buying the house? What, what, what will be the capital appreciation be like uh, in the next few years? What are the f amenities that are coming around that will add the value? Because at a certain point, you might want to sell that house, but you also don't want to sell the house cheaper than what you bought it for. So expected return, understand it, liquidity, the ability to easily convert that investment to cash, okay? Again, understand what is the type of liquidity in this fund? Is it highly liquid or is it very low in terms of liquidity? And then look at the risk, the possibility that you'll earn a lower return on your investment. So for example, shares. You know, shares you're going to eat. Today, the Safaricom share could be performing so well, you could be at 40 bob per share, for example. Then COVID happens. Everybody, boom, the share goes to 20 bob, yeah? So you need to understand the risk that at a certain point, there are certain investments that the, you will end up earning a lower return given if the market is not performing so well. Then there are those ones that were irrespective of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, the environment, you, you still have your capital preserved. So understanding risk is very critical so that you know where you're investing your money, yeah? The analogy of put, don't put all your eggs in, in one basket, okay? Now, how do I invest? Investing your money, as I said, is your money making uh, money for you. So every investment has both risk and return. There are forms of investment. So you can either do active or direct investments like buying land, buying uh, real estate, or you can do passive investments such as stocks, okay? Now we'll come to towards the end of this, as we come to end, then we'll, we'll look at what are the different types of funds based on the different type of risks that you, you have. Now, in terms of the investment planning process, we have uh, things like determ determine your investment goal. That's a fast thing. So that's a, I'm, I'm just taking you through the process. So if you've not done it, just go back after this meeting again and look at it. Determine your investment goal. What is it? Okay. Then ask yourself, what is my profile as an investor? Am I uh, risk averse? Am I moderate? Am I high? Then determine the objective, okay? Understand your investment horizon. And we'll talk about each of them quickly as we close this particular training. Then determine your 
choices. What are the choices that are there on the table that I can pick? Then monitor your investment. Okay? So what is your investment goal? At this point, you tell yourself, my goal is I want to buy a car. I want to build a home. I want to raise capital for my business. I want a retirement planning. Or I want to raise college funding. That's your investment goal. So the first step here, determine your goal. What is it? Yeah? So once you ask yourself that question, you put the goal down. Now, once you put that goal down, so for example, if you're, uh, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to say uh, you want to buy real estate investment, for example, so the first thing is you evaluate. I, I gave a, an example of real estate. Um, you can give, you can evaluate any other type of investment. You look at the payback period, for example, how long will it take to pay me back? Okay. Two, you look at the 2% rule, you should get at least 2% of your investment back every month, okay? Then, at least 2% rule. Now, uh, if you look at things like money market, for example, and we always use this analogy that don't invest in anything that is low, give, gives you a rate lower than the inflation rate. Our inflation rate, I think, is around 5.6, so give or take 6%. So if you're going to an investment that is going to give you anything lower than 6%, don't go for it, because you, you, you ideally are making losses. If, if, if you look at the bigger uh, picture here. So if something is not is giving you anything less than 6%, then really it's not a, a, a good investment option because all of that is going into inflation, okay? Then the seven year rule, the property must at least pay you, must be paid off in seven years or less because you don't also want uh, to buy something and you are, you're, you're still paying for a house 60, when you're at 60 or 70 years old. It doesn't make sense. So even at the point of saying I want to go for it, you need to make a plan and say, within seven years, I need to have cleared this loan. What am I going to do to ensure in seven years I've cleared this loan? Very critical question you need to ask yourself. Now, what kind of investor are you? The second question we talked about, okay? Are you a conservative investor, uh, investor where you are risk, you're a risk-averse investor? Are you a moderate one that you can take moderate risk? Or are you aggressive? Now, again, it does not mean you have to choose one. At the same time, you can look at your investment goal and say, for this one, I want to be conservative. This one, I want to be moderate. This one, I want to be aggressive. So it does not mean that you can choose one, but you can diversify your investment as well to take care of each of your uh, risk profiles. Now, what are your investment objectives? One could be you just want an investment that ensures you have liquidity and it's safe. And in most cases, these are things like cash and fixed deposit accounts. Uh, money market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those are the types of. If you're looking for liquidity and safety, if you're looking for incremental income, you look at things like dividends. So you're either investing in, you're buying company shares, and then at the end of the year, they're giving you dividends for it. And at the, even at that point, you really have to evaluate what, uh, in, with, under this thing called dividends, which one is the best to put my money in. There is also capital growth and appreciation. So at that point, you look at things like pass, parcels of land. Because that's where you get capital growth and appreciation. And that's what I talked about. Real estate uh, investment is also not a plot yapa kando ya boma, nikijenga apa, I will get my money back. Remember, even for real estate, it's not about that you have land here. You need to ask yourself, where is this land? What are the what are the characteristics of the area around here? In the five years, what will be this place look like? You need to ask yourself because that informs capital growth and appreciation. Don't lie to yourself that any person of land will appreciate at the same rate. No, it will not. Yeah, that's why people complain that they went and bought land in in um, in Kitengela Ukondani next to uh, God knows where and built houses and they are like nobody is living in those houses. For sure, nobody will live there. You imagine you want to rent to somebody a, la a house in Kitengela who works in Nairobi uh, needs to come to Nairobi in the morning. Um, uh, take through all that traffic and reach Nairobi and you still expect those houses to be still occupied. But you see in the back of your mind, you have this notion that, ah, uh, I have land in Kitengela, Nikijenga Pale, I will rent out and I'll get people. Of course, you're lying to yourself. So there's a lot of things that you have to understand even at the objective level to be able to know when, fine, I, I'm, I'm going to, uh, in, uh, my objective is capital growth. Now, in under capital growth and appreciation, what is this land or what is this house that I need to uh, invest in? Then we talk about uh, um, we talk about 
we talk about uh, we talk about capital preservation, uh, which is example you're just buying uh, plots. Then in terms of the investment horizon, you can look at short term, uh, medium term, or long term, depending. So short term, you're looking at something around one to five years. Um, medium term, six to ten, and long term, above ten years. So stocks or suitable for very aggressive investors as we had looked before. So what are the factors or investment choices then you pick from here is uh, look at your investment objectives, look at your risk tolerance, your liquidity needs, your time horizon, the capital injection that you require, and then participation. Is it active or, or passive? So in, in summary, in terms of investor profiling, this is what you look at. So if you are a conservative investor, you're looking at one to five years, a very low risk tolerance, rate of return is very low, risk exposure is low, liquidity needed is very high because you need your money then. And then your objective is liquidity and safety. Then a moderate investor, again, you can look at him from that perspective, six to 10 years, medium. And what they're looking at is incremental income and capital preservation. An aggressive investor on the other side is more long-term, 10 years and above. They, it's like, you know, you have 10 million that you are not using right now, or you have 500K you're not using right now. You don't seem to, you'll need it in the next 10 years. You say, I'll put it aside, I'll forget about it, and then I will think about it after 10 years. So uh, in most cases, at this point, you're just looking at capital appreciation and, and growth. Now, what are the choices that you have as a conservative investor? Because this one we've talked about, it's, 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 it's uh, liquidity and safety. So you, the investment choices that you have under that category are things like fixed deposit accounts. You have money market funds, government bonds, rental houses, or cash. Because that's what gives you the liquidity you require and the safety as well. So those five options, you can play around with them. And again, you still need to dig deeper and talk to a financial advisor, talk to somebody who understands this matter to be able to guide you further, even on these five options, which one works best for you, depending on your uh, investment objective. For somebody who's a moderate investor who is looking at uh, what we say, six to 10 years, incremental income and capital preservation, you look at things like the balance, uh, balanced mutual funds, um, and again, I'm sure Vasily team will be able to take you through this in the investment discussion, real estate and properties, uh, investment cooperatives, um, agricultural or farming, it's moderate. Uh, and again, gives you a bit of perspective. Most people go into farming thinking that tomorrow I start farming right now, a liquidity boom at the end of the month. No, uh, agriculture is a moderate investment. It's a, you're looking at six to 10 years to be able to really understand and get it right. Dairy farming, another thing. So again, agriculture, mostly looking at moderate investment, not uh, uh, liquidity safety issue within a uh, few years. In terms of aggressive investors, these are now high risk guys looking at above 10 years, you invest in stocks or shares, equity. So if you are, if you, somebody invested 10 years ago in Safaricom, Right now he's smiling, yeah, because he had a long-term vision. He said, "I'll put in my two million or ten million, and not alone, ten million that I had, uh, but I'll wait it out for ten years. I'll see how it performs." So you can imagine if this guy bought um, Safaricom share, then it was five shillings, and he bought ten million worth of it. Imagine how much money he, he has right now. Because I don't know. I think the share price. Uh, I don't know how 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 is the share price right now. Somebody who's looked at Safaricom shares in the last few days. Anyone? I think it's about 30 shillings. Yes, about 30 shillings. So you can imagine it moved from 5 shillings to 30 shillings. That guy who invested 10 million uh, to buy a share now is looking at an additional value of 25 shillings. But you remember it took a long term a long-term perspective. Equity fund, another thing, because we heavily invest also in the stock. Land, again, you look at long-term. It's not a short-term thing. Business, like Matatu businesses, those are long-term, aggressive, because they're very risky. Today, you can have it all. Tomorrow, you can have nothing. Private placement ventures, yeah? Uh, especially things like private equity. Those are things that you don't invest hoping that in two years, you'll have gained your value and moved up. No, these are things that you look at long-term, 10 years, 
um, and above. Then off-plan investments, same thing. This is not something that you say, at you know, in three years, once that house is built, I'll start getting rent and it's in ridiculous amounts. No, again, off-plan investments are long-term. You know you'll recuperate your value over after 10 years, but within that time, uh, the asset is building value for you. So just to finalize, I'll say, I'll quote Robert Kiyosaki when he talks about investment, and he says, it's not how, money, how much money you make, but how much money you keep and how hard it works for you and how many genera generations you keep it for. That is the most critical thing. It's not about how much you make right now. It's how much of that money you can keep and how hard it will work for you and how many generations you keep it for. So the world of investing can be cold and hard, but if you do thorough research and keep your head on straight, your chances of long-term success are really good. So I think that marks the end of my brief. I'll take it back to the facility team for questions. All right. Um, uh, thank you so much, Daniel. We have a few questions. I don't know whether you want to take one by one or you will go three after, after every three. How do you want to do it? We can go one by one. Uh, okay, okay, one by one. Okay. There's a question, what if the car is for private, but you use it going to work, e.g. sales? Sorry? What if you buy a car? I think that was on the loan. When you buy, you get a loan to get a car. Yes. So what if the car is for private use, but you use it for going to work, e.g. sales? Yes, now that's the one I talked about. Uh, again, it depends on what work you're talking about here. So mm -hmm. for example, in terms of your, is it's still okay, because then you are earning an income at the end of the day, but I will advise against it, yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you wanted to actually buy a car to, for personal sort of use, I'd look at an option of saving to get that money to be able to buy out that car. So you start small, save, having an investment goal of, uh, the goal could then be buying that car. But buying it off a loan, it means that you will be taking out that income that you're earning. So you can imagine if you had put in that 1.63 million over that five year period of time in, in uh, a fixed deposit or a money market, within five years, you'd have made more than that. So you can look at it from that perspective so that you ask yourself, Instead of paying off this loan, yes, I'm earning a salary at the end of the day and it can cover for it. Look at the pros and cons. Would I rather take the equivalent of that interest that I'm going to pay every other month and set it aside? And within five years, I'll be able to buy that car cash without having to go through a loan and pay interest for another five years. Uh, uh, in, uh, instead of now then going the other route of buying a debt to for personal use. So for me, I would still say it's, it's for Individually, it's still bad debt. Uh, I'd rather take that money and save it over that period of time if it is five years and then buy off that car in cash. But at least at that point in time, your money has grown. It will even be much higher than what you require. Okay. Um, I hope, uh, Joe, you have been answered. Uh, there's, there's one from Sharon. What is Auckland? How about loan to buy land? Sorry, what is? What is off plan? Yes. So and off plan. Uh, off by hand. Okay, let me answer the off plan. Then you ask me the other, and I, I didn't get it clearly. So yes. off plan is where you go uh, buy real estate before uh, the construction even begins. Uh, the beauty about it is that uh, it's always cheaper than if you are buying a ready built home. Um, so a good example is, uh, I'll use Cyton for example, we uh, sell houses off plan, which means you buy them at the point of ground breaking. There's always massive discount at that point in time. As the construction goes on you, you gain value, the one we're talking about capital appreciation. So for example, a one bed when uh, off plan Alma was, when it started off, it was around 4.4 .4 million. It's now been three years, uh, one beds are going for 6.6 .6 million. That's already 2 million on top of, of what, so if you bought it at off plan and had been paying pole pole, because also, also that's another advantage of it. You don't pay everything off at once. You can structure your payment in a way that you know within three or four years you'd have cleared off your payments and moved into your house. So that's 
offline uh, purchase. What was the other question? The other question is how about loan to buy land? Loan to buy land. And yes. To buy land. Okay. Yes. Now that is good debt because you see you're buying an asset that mm -hmm. again will have capital preservation and uh, still outlive the cost of of buying it. But uh, then also, uh, as I said, uh, be very careful in terms of land because then you have to do your own research to look at uh, things like uh, how will the value appreciate over over time, what is the location and stuff like that, so that you am I buying land where it will take me 50 years to get or do I buy land in a strategic eventually I can uh, put something up or eventually sell it at a, at a, at a higher price. So yes, uh, land is uh, a good debt um, in terms of if you're looking at a long term, if you have a long term horizon. Okay. Um, Sharon, um, it also answers the question of please outline the factors one has to consider when buying land. I think uh, Daniel has expounded on that. Um, the other question, Daniel, is please expound in debt consolidation. How can two different companies consolidate debt taken at different times? So uh, for debt consolidation, I would advise you, especially if you've taken loans from institutions, uh, financial institutions, to actually sit with... Uh, uh, so I, I'll give you a good example is what I did for myself. Uh, I had a loan in the bank and I had another one in the circle. And at a certain point, I felt like the bank was giving me a higher... Uh, I was paying too much for the bank loan. I'd taken a student loan. So I... And I knew the bank is costing me, what, 13%? And it, it, it was uh, just that because of this rate cap thing, because before, I'm sure we all know we were paying loans at the rate of 25 to 26%. But you see the circles, their loans are stuck at 12% uh, per annum. They never go up or go down. So I decided it's easier to consolidate and have all those loans within the circle because then the payment is much easier and uh, uh, I'll only be permitting to one, one, one institution. So the circle is then running a, a, a campaign and saying, uh, if you have three, four loans, out there please come let's help you consolidate so start with them they looked at it they said okay fine uh, we can spread it uh, uh, out on the tenure that you have with our current loan or we can mix it up and give you a new tenure of five years and you start repaying it from that point of view so from there now they consolidate everything so i've borrowed from standard i've borrowed from the cb i've borrowed from wherever they take all those loans it's like buying they buy those loans they consolidate it to one and then you start paying it off from there I hope that addresses the question. Sharon, um, I hope it addresses your question. Then there's one from Thomas for mortgages. Does the 7% rule still matter if you're an occupant? Sorry, does it? 7% rule for mortgage. 7%. Just a second, let me go there. The seven, seven year rule. Yes, yeah, seven year rule. Mm -hmm. Does it? Does it matter if you are an mm -hmm. occupant? If you are an occupant of the house? Yes. Yes, it matters. Okay. Remember, value is not based on who is living in the house. Mm -hmm. Value is accredi accredited to the asset. That's why. It's, you see, if, if, even if you're not living there, you'll still be paying it off. Whether you're living or not living, you're still paying it off. So the seven-year rule is to enable you to finish off the loan so that you can start uh, creating value. Because after seven years, if you're living in it, it means the rental, the rental uh, uh, expense that you'll have had every end of the month in another location, now mm -hmm. it's out. And that's the value you start creating. The same thing if you had rented it out, uh, the rental income you start earning, now net of any interest will be higher. So the seven-year rule is just there to ensure that you also aggressively, because remember, the more you're paying that loan, the more interest is coming up. And just do a quick calculation today. 
if you are to take a, a mortgage of 12 million right now for 25 years, you know you'll be paying close to double. You'll be paying close to 24 million at the end of 25 years. So ask yourself, why would you go through payment of an asset that by the time you are even old, your gray hair, you're still paying for it. Yeah? So that's where the seven year rule comes in that you're able to clear it off so that you can start gaining value either from rental income coming in or you as a person not having to incur any additional interest in paying out. And if you pay it out that fast, it means then you also your interest because it's on reducing balance. It means that you're, um, you'll take lower interest in the long run. You'll pay lower, a lower interest in the long run. Okay. Um, you've advised that one should get a financial advisor to get out of debt. What is the going rate for such services? Uh, I am not conversant with the rates in the market, mm -hmm. but then uh, for me, I will start with uh, you speaking to a friend who is in that space. As a financial advisor, you can speak to Vasily. I'm sure they will be open to offering it for free. Let me not talk about their, yes, them sure. offering the service for free. Mm -hmm. But there are companies that if you get a financial advisor, is able to advise you quickly on some of these matters. Or you get a friend who knows a friend who can help guide you through this debt management. Because I wouldn't want to go the pay route first because you can pay for something and it really won't work for you. So I'd rather start with uh, individuals such as Vasily who can take you up and advise you on some of these things and tell you what you can do to be able to get out of debt uh, before you can even explore those you know, uh, expensive rates. So financial advisory for a bigger part of this market, what I know is that it's actually free. So you can reach out to Vasily and they can help connect you. Thank you. Um, the other question is given an, an option between um, money market and short-term saving insurance policies, what would you go for and why? In terms of uh, money market and? Uh, and short-term saving insurance policies, what would you I will go, go for? I'll go for money market reason being the liquidity. Again, as I talked about, you have to ask yourself what's your, this bit here. Um, this question, what are your investment objectives? Are you looking at liquidity and safety? Because even those two things don't, don't, um, they don't, they're not, they're not in the same, uh, they are not they are not of the same investment objectives so because insurance policies and I've been a, one of the people who suffered heavily on it had taken I think a three year five year policy and uh, within three years I discovered this thing doesn't make sense so I went and told them I want to get my money out uh, unfortunately to be told that I cannot get my money out and if I I shut down that thing I lose everything Compare that with money market where your capital is preserved. You cannot lose anything and you can get your money instantly when you want it. So depending on your investment objective, you choose. So insurance, I look at it as more of a long term. Uh, somebody who has moderate uh, risk, medium term and long term, to long term. Short term, I'll, I'll look at money market. Insurance is more of a mid to long term uh, sort of horizon investment. Okay. Um, I think we, we have answered all the questions. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel, for taking us through personal financial planning and debt management. We shall be having other um, sessions that are coming up. From, uh, on Friday, we have one on stocks, investing in stocks and balance funds. Um, next week, we are having one from CIC. Um, they will be talking about money market funds and fixed deposits and to go on like that um so we have as i said earlier we have sessions from this week to around mid of july so keep us engaged talk to us um email us at info at vasiliafrica.com for any questions any further questions and follow-ups um my email ad address is arungare at vasiliafrica it's I've shared uh, on top there Talk to us and sign up uh, on the webinar for the webinars at uh, on the website. The link has also been sent.